All right. Good evening, everyone. We are seven o'clock and I uh, want to make sure that, uh, you know, we kind of continue to go forward with where we are going um, in Bible study. So uh, let's open up with prayer and then we will uh, go and proceed from there for tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day, another opportunity to study your holy word we pray father that you will just reveal and we ask that you will reveal things out of your word that we did not know or that will just help us with greater revelation that will speak to not only our situation but those around us father it is our prayer that as we go through bible study tonight that we have an even greater appreciation not only for the name of jesus but the power that is associated attached that comes with that name that we might not only reverence it but Father, we may see the beautiful blessings of it. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those who were impacted um, by not only both Hurricane Helene as well as Hurricane Milton. Father, we thank you for safety and some of the praise reports that we have heard. But we pray, God, for all those who are impacted, that your provision and your relief be there for them and for, for your people in this time, Lord, that they may continue to see your hand. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. All right. So um, just quickly and uh, <clears throat> in-person service will be this Sunday uh, at 10 o'clock. And, uh, uh, you know, we had a great time in in-person service last week. And so I thank the Lord for that um, as well. And then uh, Bible study again, Lord willing, next Thursday night as we'll continue in probably in where we are or tonight. I, will, I probably won't finish everything that I have for tonight anyway. and We'll go on from there. Uh, and then uh, men's Bible study will be this Saturday uh, at 10 o'clock on Zoom. And so uh, we certainly want to make sure that we are able to uh, do that piece. And um, I'm excited about what the Lord has given to our brother Antonio Newman. So um, we are grateful for him for that. And I just say all men, just tune in. Uh, certainly you will certainly be blessed. All right. Um, so as many of you know, and I want to make sure that I go back to where we were uh, last week we talked about, you know, the whole thing about uh, Yeshua and that Bible says online. I thank God for the media team for putting these things online. Um, is Yeshua the only name we should call Jesus by? I will say this. If you missed Bible study last week, uh, please go back and listen to that because I'm just going to continue to go forward with where we were. And so where we kind of ended up on that was obviously, first of all, that's not the only name we called him by. That's not the only name he referred to himself as. So I don't know who, what human beings think that it's okay for them to start telling Christ what, what, <laughs> what his name is and what he's going to be called by, but I'm not going to get into that. We did last week, um, the names of Jesus in the old test. After we did the lesson on that, we did started doing some where we see Jesus's names in the old Testament. I do want to continue with that piece in the New Testament, but then after that, I want to look at the names and titles of Jesus that we see. So some of this might be a bit uh, overlapping, but it's okay. When you understand the power of that name, you'll be all right. <laughs> so trust me, uh, many a prayer, uh, many a petition, many a change uh, has come as a result of the power of the name. And I'm going to say this before I even go into the, into the new Testament. One of the great revelations for me last week was not only, you know, some of the things we went through, but really something in a moment of Bible study that really kind of stuck to me too, was that it's, it's not just that, that that is his name. It's not that he just answers so many names. It is that the demons know. And, and really that was one of the scriptures I was going to go to tonight, but the Lord just had me do whatever, but you know, in the account with the sons of Skeva, I mean, you know, their thing was the, even the demons or the, or the evil spirits were like, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know, but who are you? So even at times when Jesus walked on the earth, the demons would say, what has thou to do with us? Jesus, right? The son of David. And, and so if the demons know him as Jesus outside of Yeshua, the son of the son of David, if the demons know him as that, I don't understand why human beings who claim to be after him are having an issue <laughs> that, that it, it just boggles my mind. But here's what I do know. As, 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 as Deacon Nicobola said, he's answered 
to the name Jesus because I'm a, I'm a living witness. I prayed to him and he's answered. The demons would tell you, oh, that if you don't want to call that name and if you think about it, it's almost demonic in, in that people are trying to limit him in his name because the demons know that when I hear that name, when I hear any pieces of that name or anything he's referred to as that name, when I hear it, I understand I got to flee. That's all I'm saying. So, all right. So, uh, so I want to look at my, first the, the names of Jesus in the New Testament or um, how he appears in the New Testament. And then I want to go through the names and titles of Jesus overall, kind of in an alphabetical order. But I'm going to have scripture with each one of those. And so I just want to kind of make sure I finish what I've started last week. So we did. We completed up the New Test, or Old Testament last week. So now we're going to go into the New Testament of Jesus. In the, in, the, in the four Gospels, in Matthew, uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus, Genesis, and Revelation, this is the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, he's the son of man, servant of the Lord, son of God, son of David. They called him rabbi. They called him teacher. They called him father. He was referred to as the bridegroom, the spirit, Emmanuel, God with us. He's the cornerstone, the light of the world, the good shepherd, the savior born to us in the city of David, All right? Christ the Lord and the word become flesh dwelling among us. I don't see Yeshua or even Jesus anywhere in there. Now, mind you, I would like to point out that the gospel writers walked with him. If anybody, even, even above Peter and Paul, if, if, wouldn't they know? Okay. In Acts, he is Christ, the risen Lord, proclaiming salvation to the nations. In Romans, he's the justifier. In First and Second Corinthians, he is the spirit at work in the churches. In Galatians, he is the righteousness imputed to us by faith. Oh, my goodness. In Ephesians, he is our righteous armor. <laughs> In Philippians, he is the God who meets every need. In Colossians, he is the firstborn of all creation. In First and Second Thessalonians, he's descending from heaven, coming to meet us together in the cloud. In other words, he is the rapture, all right? In First and Second Timothy, he's the one mediator between God and man. In Titus, he is our faithful pastor, the bishop and the overseer of our souls. As we say in, in, in Philemon, he's our redeemer, restoring us to service. In Hebrews, he's our great high priest. In James, he's the life at work in our faith. Right. In first and second, Peter, he's our living cornerstone In first, second and third, John, he's our advocate pleading his righteousness. In our place. In Jude, he's God, our savior, the one who keeps us from stumbling and presents us blameless or faultless in his presence with great joy. You know, I love this. I'm going to stop this because Derek Madison know where I'm going to go with this because I love it. The one thing I love about, the, about, about the, the Jew scripture and one of the benedictions, if you will, is that now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. That don't mean, I understand what it says in Proverbs that a righteous man falls seven times and, and rise again. But if we really look at that scripture in Jew, it says he's able to keep us from falling. See, you know, the lot and, and the lie that, that, that a lot of believers go into is that, well, I'm going to fall. And I'm, and I'm not saying that's not a reality, but I don't have to live like that. I, you know, I really should, should begin to try to live like, you know what? I serve a God. I serve the Savior who is able to keep me from falling and present me faultless. <laughs> Amen. Before the throne of grace. And in Revelation, he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
That's how that's how he he's shown in the New Testament. Now, again, y'all know I, I like to put the word on. I know in the old in, in those lists, I didn't you know give you scripture per se, but again, every last one of them's accurate. Now, don't get me wrong, but on when I want to look at some of the names and titles of Jesus, I wanted to look at this um, with scripture, and so uh, I think that this is a good way to do this and just learn this. Now, this is a very long list. <laughs> So if I don't get through it tonight, it's okay. We'll be all right, right? Uh, if I do get through it tonight, that's great, right? But when we look at this, what we need to understand is, is that he's, I want us to look at this list really as not only the names and the titles, but some of these even show what he did. Uh, it wasn't just, it was not only who he was, but but it is, it's not only who he is, who he was, but also what he did what he stands for, what he represents. So as we look at that in the totality of it all, it's a beautiful list. It really is. And I tried to just break them up to one at a time because I just didn't want to throw too much because I think each one deserves its own time, so to speak. But, and again, he's known as Adam in 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. That's why he's referred to as the second Adam. What the first Adam lost as a living soul, the second Adam right, redeemed it and brought it back and restored it as a quick, it means made alive. So, so, so the death that was lost in the garden was made alive again by the second Adam. He's the advocate in 1 John 2 and 1, my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Who is that? Jesus Christ, the righteous. An advocate is the one who makes their appeal on our behalf. The one who stands an advocate is really um, what one looks at like a lawyer in a courtroom. Now, I know if y'all if y'all been around for any time, you've you've heard the old saying tell you <laughs> that he's a doctor. I'm, I'm gonna leave that alone. He is a lawyer in the courtroom, though. Here's the thing about this: he's an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. Right? We have an advocate. So when you look at the scripture, and, so, and y'all know, I always say, slow scripture down a little bit so you can appreciate it. My little children, right? We must come unto him like little little children, right? These things I write unto you that ye sin not. Here's the reason why they were written, that we wouldn't sin, right? But, okay, but he understands that we're dust. He understands that we have a sin nature. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. In other words, we have a righteous, if you will, attorney who will stand before the judge of all and plead our case. <laughs> the beauty of that is, is that he stands in between us and the judge. That's why his shed blood is so beautiful. Because what the, what, what the judge sees is the blood and not us. Anyway, you know what? Listen, only a sinner saved by grace can appreciate that. When God looks at us that are believers, he sees the blood. Amen. He doesn't see because those sins have been washed away. Amen. You ought to have, you, you need, you need the buffer. Okay. I'm not going to preach, but I'm going to say this and move on. You need the buffer of the blood. <laughs> That's all I'll say. Uh, all, he is almighty revelation. I am alpha and omega, the beginning and the beginning and the ending saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come the almighty. See, here's the thing about this. That means then this actually speaks to the Trinity. Whether some want to acknowledge it or not, because he's still God, right? So again, he's he's the beginning and the ending, Alpha and Omega, saith the Lord, which which he is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Jehovah, the one who was, the one who is, and will always be, right? We know Jesus he is, was, right? And we know he is going to return. He's the Almighty. Then again, we see again Alpha and Omega. He is 
the beginning and the end. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. We see that that same word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's why he can easily say that Abraham saw my day and was glad. Before Abraham was, I am. He could say all of those things because he is. And here's the thing, too, I need for us to understand, just even on a, on a different side of this. This is what makes God God. He is the one who is eternally existent, has always existed and always will exist. Not one that it was created. All other things were created by him and for him. But he is the one who is eternal, always have existed. It's amazing. Some scientists will believe that the universe is that way, even though the universe is aging. If it's aging, it had a starting point. But won't but won't won't wrap their head around the fact that Almighty is. Okay. He is the Amen. <laughs> In Revelation 3:14, it says, And unto the angel of the Lord of the Laodosians write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. The Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Firstborn among all creation. And here's what that means. A lot of people, and even some of these folk in the Black Hebrew Israelites, some of these other folk want to take this so out of context, is that he was the lamb that was slain for the foundation of the world. So the father, so so it was already known in foreknowledge, right? Which doesn't take away free will. For just because I know something don't mean that I made you do something. Um, what they try to say is, well. But that means he can't be God because he was born. No. See, this was already planned and prepared. He's fully human and fully divine. He, his divinity always existed. His humanity is the beginning of the creation of God. Huh. Interesting. Firstborn of all creation. That's why it says it that way, because he still had to be born of a virgin and live a sinless life to make the right exchange for us, but his divinity is eternal. His, his divinity is the amen. Apostle of our profession. Hebrews 3 and 1 says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of, of our profession, Christ Jesus. That means he had a heavenly calling that was divine. But that was played out on earth in his fully human flesh. Right? So he has, wherefore, holy brother, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider, right? Because because the church doesn't exist without Jesus. He's a true apostle and high priest, right? He's the one who's overall of, of our profession, Christ Jesus. So even those who are in, if you will, ministry sake we must always consider that that he is the supreme <laughs> he is the arm of the lord and this actually appears in a, in a couple of different places isaiah 51 and 9 says awake awake put on strength O arm of the lord awake as in the ancient days in the generations of old art thou now art, art thou not it that hath cut rahab and wounded the drag. Right? O arm of the Lord, awake, as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Art thou now? Art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? If you look at this, oh my goodness. If you look at this, this is looking at both the beginning and the end. Rahab is, is a piece, obviously, of the Old Testament, but the dragon is a piece of the apocalyptic language that we see in Revelation. But right here in the middle of in the middle of the Bible, Isaiah is speaking to it. Then Isaiah 53 and 1 said, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Who is the arm of the Lord? That is him. That is Christ. He is <laughs> the arm of the Lord. It's not he, the arm of the Lord, not too short that it can't say. <laughs> Amen. Uh, he's the author and finisher of our faith. This is just probably one of the great scriptures for me 
in the Bible because it's just, it's, I don't know, it's so beautiful. So, so I, I really want to slow this down. Looking unto Jesus, right? Who is what? He's the author and finisher of our faith. That means he writes it out. <laughs> and what he writes out will come to pass because he doesn't write it incomplete. But our faith is what taps into everything that he has authored and is already ordained to finish. Who, and here's how we, we make no mistake who we're talking about, even though it says looking unto Jesus. And by the way, that's New Testament. So that would have been at best in, in Greek, that would have been Jesus. But, but you know, if, if, they, if you want to write a Hebrew and say, yes, you will, that's fine too. For who, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Can't be nobody but him. Despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is what makes him the advocate too. Because when we pray, we pray in Jesus name. We pray because he is the one who's at the right hand of the throne of, of, the throne of God and is making that petition. Now, but when we look at this, and, and this is what's beautiful to me is, you know, that means then that as a believer, when I have faith in him, he's written my story to completion. <laughs> and here's why, I want y'all to look at this scripture now. That's why for those who have faith, he has joy that was set before him. That's why he endured the cross because he knows the story from beginning to end. You know what? Look, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He said, you know what? I'll take the shame for those who have faith in me. You know, it, most of us will say this as parents, uh, spouses or whatever, siblings, whoever. For people we love, let me put it that way. I'll take do it to me. Don't do it to them. Right? Leave them alone because I love I'll take it on for them. I'll take it on for my kids. I'll take it on for my spouse. I'll take it on for my parents. I'll take it. No. Right. So what Jesus says was, because, and here's the thing, I know. And he really knows the beginning and the end. He says, and they're gonna have faith in me and their story. Is written to completion. He says, I take joy in that that was set before him. He endured. He said, I'll take the cross that they might run the race and finish it. I'll take the shame of the cross that they might, that their story that's been authored and finished. Hey, and sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. I mean, there's so much in this, but he's known as, it's not only a title, it's not only that, it's not only who he is, he is who he was. It is what he does. For those of us who walk in faith, we need to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. Then he's the author of eternal salvation. Hebrews 5, 9 says, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Hmm. That's pretty, that's pretty awesome, isn't it? And being made perfect, because he was sinless. He was a sinless sacrifice. But he had to go and he had to endure the cross. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. You say, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's obedience. Right? Obedience is faith put to work. I believe you, God, so much that I'll obey you. I'll trust you and do what you say. He's the author of eternal salvation. He's the beginning of creation of God. Revelation 3.14, unto the angel of the church of Laodosians write, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And I know we read scripture earlier, but here's the thing about this. Again, that's what he is. He's eternal. 
but he is fully human and fully divine. And he was a lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. So the father already knew what was going to take place. But again, because foreknowledge does not, does never negates free will choice. Because I know don't mean I made you do. He's a beloved son. Matthew 12, 18, behold my servant, whom I've chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. All right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, listen, he says that behold, and even at that, my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Right. So we understand that. I, I think this is King James. So maybe a different version, but nevertheless, we know that that scripture exists and it is that. Then blessed and only potentate. He is, which is in his time. In which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings and lord of lords. He's the sovereign God, the sovereign king. And guess what? In his times he shall show. <laughs> and he continues to show it. He shows his power daily. He shows his strength daily. He shows his presence daily. He shows his love daily. He shows his mercy daily. He is the branch. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. And the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. I'm... <sighs> It's so wonderful to just look at how he's referred to throughout scripture. And all of these really are images sometimes that we need to see that it is one. I mean, you know, the, the thing about this, and we, we'll we we'll go to one later where he talks about, obviously, he's divine and we're the branches. But even when we look at this, and of course, that's Jesus saying that about himself in John 15. But in that in that day shall the branch of the Lord. Right. And we understand that the power of a branch and what it what it does and its ability. The branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely from them that are escape of Israel. A branch is where the fruit is born. That's why Jesus said, I'm divine. You're the branches. He said, if you remain in me, you'll bear much fruit. He's talking to the branches. So we understand that even when he's referred to as a branch of the Lord, he's beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the earth. Uh, shall be excellent and comely, which is beautiful for them that are escape of Israel. So the fruit that he displays for us, for those who are escape of Israel, and this is a, a prophetic word to them, but it is saying still it is for our partaking because he is that branch. He is the one who is the source of the fruit. That's why the fruit is a resource, but he's the source. He is the bread of life. <laughs> Amen. Then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. You know, the beauty of this, and this is, here's where we shouldn't miss this. Even in what Jesus is saying about Moses, um, God fed them with manna from heaven. But manna was designed to feed them for the day. And then they would collect so they wouldn't have to go out. They would collect extra on the day before the Sabbath because so that they wouldn't have to go out and, and collect on the Sabbath day. And that's as long as it was going to last. Right. It was a temporary bread that would provide sustenance and nourishment for God's people for the moment. But it, in this last clause, he said, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. This is the bread that feeds for all eternity because he is the bread of life. Not just life to sustain life here, but he is the bread of eternal life. And there's a significant difference in the bread that Moses gave because that was really a temporary piece, but it was still manna from heaven. What he was telling them is that God has given you something so much greater that will last for all eternity. He is the captain of salvation in Hebrews 2 and 10. For it became him from for whom all things and by whom 
by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Uh, you know, to me, this is this is almost like the chief cornerstone kind of thing, and, and but it just uses a different a different title. He's the captain of salvation it, before he became him. For whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. You know, it says even in the biblical text that God taught Christ obedience through suffering. In other words, he displayed it, right? He taught him obedience through suffering. So we taught, we're taught, in other words, obedience through suffering. And how we see that is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus said, if possible, let this cup pass from me. Um, but not obviously not my will, thy will be done. He was suffering, but he obeyed because of the fact that again, the father didn't take that cup from him. So, so the other option was to obey and that obey obedience came through suffering. Here's the thing about this. And it, and I know a lot of people just don't like it. Um, but it's still the truth. Cause you're still going to go through it. I mean, like, you know, sometimes he teaches us obedience, through suffering. I know that. I know that don't feel good. But it'll yield some good fruit. It'll yield some good fruit. <laughs> All right. He's the chief shepherd. First Peter 5 and 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now, Peter is, make, is, is, almost, is looking at this from an, from an apocalyptic standpoint um, and from an eschatological standpoint or eschatology where we're looking at the end times because he's talking about him basically reappearing. We know Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd, but that was why he was walking with us. And when, see, he's looking forward. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, see, because that's when. Ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Oh, that's that's good. Listen, and this is how you got to look at it. He's the good shepherd. As David would say, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If 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 he's that good, and my that's my experience. In this sinful world where he has had to teach me obedience even through suffering, but he's still the good shepherd. Oh, how much more should I look forward to the chief shepherd when he shall appear and I receive a crown of glory that faded not away. It's Christ of God. He's at Luke 9, 20. He said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Peter answering said the Christ of God or Thou art the Christ, right? And so one of the things about this is that we have to recognize at some point, I always say this, the thing I do love about this um, is at some point Jesus asks us all this question. But what about you? Who do you say I am? Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and he would go on to tell Peter, Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my father in heaven. Now, that's the beauty of it. But at some point, we got to answer that question. But whom do you say that I am? Not who Big Mama said. See, th this is why, because parents can't choose Jesus for you. They, they, we should certainly raise our kids up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. We should, we should certainly make the introduction to Jesus, and we should model Jesus before our kids and those those who come behind us right but it can't choose them for them. that choice has to be mine it has to be that one individual choice and at some point we have that we all have to answer this question but what about you whom do you say that i am amen all right he's the consolation of israel luke 2 and 25 and i love this scripture with you know in the birth the birth narrative of jesus and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And he goes on later on in that same piece, if you want to go and read it on your own as he goes on. 
he really begins to praise and bless the name of the Lord because he has seen the Christ child. He knows who he is because he had been awaiting for him. Simeon's like, look, I take me now. I haven't seen him. <laughs> right. And, and again, he had been waiting because he was a just and devout man. He was waiting for the, he's the consolation of Israel. The sad thing is that Israel in a vast majority don't appreciate what was sent to them. They don't receive what was sent to him as of yet. I'm, a, I'm, I'm like, I'm like Simeon. I'm, I'm, I'm holding out. And I believe at some point, the majority of the Jews will come to accept and to receive Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the son of God sent into the world to save them of their sins. And the message, the one who brings forth the Gentiles as well. See, well, I, I'm not even good to that. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. I, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Because a lot of that comes from our own sinful flesh of wanting just Jesus for us or wanting him for ourselves to make us special. Oh, he didn't die. My father-in-law, God rest his soul, told me one time, a long time ago, I remember that we were having a conversation. He said, you know, Jesus didn't just die for black people. I was on one of my, you know, uh, one of them, them rants. And he said, listen, he died for everybody. And you know what? The truth will stop you. And I said, and you know, that was really a turning point for me because of the fact that I had to recognize and realize that here Christ didn't see it the way that the world has tried to divide us. But that salvation was available. It is accessible, attainable, and available for everyone, regardless of color or race, all right? He is the cornerstone, Psalm 118 and 22. The stone which the builders refuse is become the head stone of the queen, the chief cornerstone. That is who he is. Amen. That's, that's a beautiful thing, all right? We see even this is referred to, Paul refers to this um, in the New Testament as well. So again, this is a Psalm 118, but, but we see that as well. He is also known as counselor. And, and I know that this list kind of goes through. So when I hit it again, I'll just, you know, I know we've kind of highlighted this a little bit. Um, is that for unto us, we know Isaiah 9 and 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. This is about who he is and what he does and what, what he represents and, and part of his purpose. This is not even really about titles. Titles get into here later. And his name shall be called. It's not only the title, it's about what he does, his abilities as well. Wonderful. It speaks to it speaks to his nature. He is wonderful. He is counselor, right? That's what he does. I mean, he's he is our great counselor. He is that the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. He's all of that. That's why you can't limit him by saying that you're only supposed to address him as Yeshua when he didn't say that. Cre he's creator, John 1, 3. All things were made, I love this scripture. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In that same John 1, 3, because they're talking about the word prior to this. You go down to verse 14 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. <sighs> That's the beauty of it. He is the creator. There was nothing made. And without him was not anything made that was made. If you go back to Genesis, when it says, let us make man in our image and likeness, the us speaks to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Day spring. Luke, seven, Luke 1, I'm sorry, 78. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. <laughs> eh. See, listen, here's the thing. Through the tender mercy of our God, we needed the day spring. We needed the nourishment. We needed what was necessary. Despite our actions and behavior sometimes, despite our conduct sometimes, we needed 
the visitation of the day spring. <laughs> I shouldn't say needed. We need. I should, let me let me change it. We need. He's a deliverer. Romans eleven twenty six. I know y'all being blessed. Y'all quiet, but y'all listen. This is a lot to take in. But but again, I just wanted us to see this in totality with Scripture as well. That you know he. We see him throughout the 66 books known as the Holy Bible. We see him all throughout, not just in the New Testament and not just in the Gospels. All right. He's deliverer. Romans eleven twenty six. 26. So all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Yeah, that's that's beautiful, right? There shall come out of Zion the deliverer. Uh, if you could, if we could appreciate what the deliverer is and what it means, the deliverer is to do just that and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. The deliverer is the one who delivers me from ungodliness. It delivers me. From them old habits and behavior. It delivers me from the life that I had past. It delivers me from even unbelief and not having faith and not obeying. It he is the deliverer. The desire of the nations, hey God, chapter two, verse seven, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, said the Lord of hosts. <sighs> That's why the scripture says, I'm trying to remember right off the top of my head. Just, <laughs> righteousness exalts, it's a, it's a scripture in Proverbs, righteousness exalts a nation and sin destroys any people or something like that. I think it might have said in, in, in NIV. But here's the thing. The desire of all nations shall come because the desire of all nations at some point is going to be salvation. Now, some are going to wait too late. Ain't going to miss it. But there's some, but but here's the thing. In every nation, there is going to be some who will desire him. How you know that? When I go to Revelation chapter 7, it tells me, Behold, I saw a multitude that no man could number. Of all tribes and nations. That's what it talks about. So again, there's going to be some in all. Amen. Proverbs 14. Thank you. Verse 14, 34. Right. And that's the beauty of it. Righteousness will exalt a nation, but sin condemns any people. There it is. There, thank you. Uh, it's the beauty of it. So every nation should desire the righteousness of God because that will exalt them. But within every nation, there will be those who will desire him and had his coming because when he saw a multitude that no man could number, they were dressed in their uh, white robes and, and with palm branches in their hand. They came from every nation with every tongue. And that's the beauty of it. <sighs> he is the door. Then Jesus said unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. He said, Any man comes any other way is a thief and a robber. There ain't but one way. One way. He said to them again, very, very, I said to you, I'm the door of the sheep. When he says, you know, he goes on later in 14, you know, listen, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's because he's the door. When he's saying, even in John 10, he's telling them, there's no other way to come in. If you come in any other way, that's a thief. You're being a thief and a robber. In other words, you're trying to steal salvation, but you're not going to be able to steal salvation because salvation comes by only one way, by the door. <laughs> he is the elect of God. Behold, Isaiah 42 and 1, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, whom my soul delighted. I put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Here's the beauty of God. Yeah, he brings forth judgment to the Gentiles, but he also brought grace and truth. He also brought them 
brought Gentiles, he brought us an opportunity to come and be saved. In whom my soul did I put my spirit upon him? He shall. See, when we look at when he was baptized by John the Baptist, right? This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. It says, look, not only behold my servant whom I hold, he said, mine elect, in whom my soul delighted. It said, we saw the spirit descending on him, right? I put put I put my spirit on him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. This is what caused really a lot of the Jews to miss him. He's the everlasting father. And I know we went through this already uh, in Isaiah 9 6. One tells the child is born, the son is given. Unto us the Son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulders, shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He's God in flesh. He is that. He's the faithful witness. <laughs> right? Revelation 1 and 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the Prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Here's the thing I, I, I do love about the faithful witness and, and just in different ways. Uh, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in, in his own blood. Because he's a faithful witness. That's why you can't change what I know. That's why some folks try to tell me this, that, and other about, you know, salvation. They want to put all these human ramifications and parameters and and asterisks and everything else on. Let me tell you something. Here's what I know. I know he knows my genuine confession. I know he knows that the belief in my heart that he is the Christ and that God raised him from the dead. He, I know he knows. And here's the thing. Just as Satan is an accuser of the brother in day and night, here's what I know. I know he wouldn't stand before the Father on judgment day and tell a lie. But he's a faithful witness. And he will say, yes, th th this is this is mine who was washed in my own blood. <laughs> that's why, that's why, listen, that's why what other folks say don't matter. Right? That's why what, what he says matters, because he is the faithful witness. Hey, man, you know, even in a courtroom, they don't allow hearsay. You a hearsay witness. You don't even get up on the stand or they're going to strike whatever you say. Amen. Okay. First and last, Revelation 1 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, to Fear not, for I am the first and the last. <laughs> Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Again, these just reiterate who he is throughout Scripture. In other words, if I abide in his word, if I read his word, study his word, his word is in me then I can't miss him. Right? Okay. Let's keep going. First begotten, Revelation 1.5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of kings of earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Again, we see he's the first begotten of the dead. All right? And like I said, I know some of these are redundant, but again, I want us to see them even in their individuality. All right? He's the forerunner. Uh, Hebrews 6 and 20. Whither? The forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. All right. Again, what we see is the Old Testament is a foreshadowing, if you will, of Jesus coming in the New Testament. And so that's why we see that. Um, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest, even after the order of, of Melchizedek. He is the high priest, as we saw earlier. He's the glory of the Lord. Isaiah 40 and 5. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed in all flesh. So see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. When Jesus returns for sure. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. When the trumpet call of God comes, right? We're going to see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Right. Because the dead in Christ going to rise first and those who remain will be caught up with them to meet it in the air. So here's the thing. That's because he has come and the glory has now been revealed and all flesh will see it together. 
<laughs> he is the glory of the Lord. He is God. Isaiah 43, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Even before he was on the earth as fully human and fully divine, we need to understand that he is, he was, is, and will always be God. Amen. That he is God blessed. Romans 9 and 5. Who are the fathers? Whose are the fathers? I'm sorry. And of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Right? So, so here's the thing. He is blessed of God. We know that. But who are the fathers? And of whom concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. He is forever blessed. That's one of the reasons why we bow before him. That's one of the reasons why we worship him. That's one of the reasons why we receive him is because he is, he is, God has blessed him forever. For all eternity, he's blessed. That's why we ought to bow before him. That's why we ought not be ashamed to worship and praise him. He's blessed forever. That's why we ought not be ashamed to call him ours. You're ashamed of, of, of him before men. He said, I'll be ashamed of you in front of my heavenly father and in, in front of my father and the holy angels. Here's the thing about this is that we ought to recognize him as blessed forever and not be ashamed of him. He is the good shepherd. <laughs> and I, again, I, I know we, we talked about being the captain uh, shepherd, but here's the thing about this is John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd. This is very clear. That's who I am. Even if we stop right there, that's enough. But he goes on to tell us what the good shepherd does. He says, I am the good shepherd. We can end it right there. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. The question is, we want to be sheep or you want to be goats? That's what, it, I find it funny that people really worship the goats of this world, the greatest of all time is what the acronym is. But man, if you read your Bible, you won't want to be the goat. You want to be the sheep. Yeah, y'all can have all that. I just want to be a sheep. Because he'll give his life for the sheep. And when he makes separation, he separates the sheep from the goats. And the goats are going where I don't want to go. The sheep going where I want to go. They're going with the good shepherd. The governor, Matthew 2 and 6, and thou Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art thou not the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So here's the thing. Paul would say, and I, I like this. Thank you, Holy Ghost, just for this revelation. Here's one of the beauties of this. Paul says, you know, I can't be all things all. You know, I try to be all things all. I can't really be all things all. Christ is, was, and will always be. That's something we ought to remember. Right? I mean, he is all things to all people. If you choose him, Hey, man, I don't know about you. I, I just love my a couple of my members told me they were just they were shouting in their kitchen thinking about his name last week. And you know what? That Bible said last week really did bless me because I'm telling you, when you start looking at his name, who he is, what he does, what he represents, the purpose of all of this, and you start to see it all over the biblical text and you see it in so many ways, in so many places, it, it can't it can't help but move you. You know why? Because I don't care who you are. He's been a, he's been many of these things. He might not have been all of them to you, but he's been many of these things to you. And as the old saints would say, if you if you keep on living, he's gonna be more of them to you. He's the great high priest. All right. Uh Hebrews 4 and 14. Seeing then we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Right? Even in this, and there are other scriptures that talk about him being a high priest who was tempted in the same way we were, but yet without sin. 
we have a great high priest. Here's the difference, because the high priest used to go in once a year for the sins of the people, right? I mean, and, and you know what? If a, if a high priest did good and did his job, did his role, God bless him, right? But they weren't the great high priests. Who washes away our sins every day and gives us new mercies. His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Who washes away our sins and remembers them no more. Who puts them behind his back. Hmm. Amen. He is the head of the church. Amen. Ephesians 1 22, and he hath put and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. A church is not a church when Jesus ain't the head. When you find a church mess and church nonsense, it don't mean everybody's in there is about it, but it means at some point, some folks done lost sight of who the head is. I ain't around to say what the word said. And he had put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. There are people in, I ain't going to even get, there are people in church who will tell you, I don't care what the Bible says. This is how we're going to do this. I'm going to do this. That ain't the church no more. You in a club, you in whatever you, social club, you in whatever. You in your own world. But that ain't the church. He's the head of all things in the church. If Christ, listen, if the cloud don't leave, we don't move. The cloud by day or the fire by night, we don't move. He the head overall. He makes decisions in the church. He does. And you know what? It's a simple, I'm going to give you a little simple thing that you can do in the church. All you got to do is say, Lord, you know what? Show us what, what your desire is. See, God is not out to get us. Right. It doesn't please him when we disobey. So if I ask him what his will and what his desire is, he'll show it because his desire is that we would obey, especially in a place that he's head over. Amen. He's head over all things to the church. That's the real church. He's heir of all things. Hebrew one and two hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. It talks about in verse one, how God, you know, in sundry times spoke through the prophets. But now in these last days, it said, hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom, also, he made the worlds. Now, here's here's this, and I, and I just need for you to get this. It doesn't mean that people don't have prophetic moments or prophetic, that God don't use people who are prophets in, in the role or whatever. But anything that a true prophet speaks is spoken of by, his, by the son. It aligns with what the son has said. A false prophet is easy to identify. All you got to do is line up with what they say with the word. Because at some point, if they're a false prophet, there's going to be conflict and contradiction with what the word says and what they're saying. That's why I've told you all, I am not comfortable ever telling you all to not do something that God said do or to tell you to do something that God said don't do. Because he hath in these last days spoken to us by his son. Period. If I don't get it and get the approval from God, mm -mm, I, don't, I don't want no parts of that. All right, let me keep going. He is the holy child. Acts 4.27, for of a truth against thy holy child, Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. <laughs> when they were calling the roll on them, see? For truth against thy holy child, Jesus, whom thou hast anointed. He's anointed one who had the anointing. Both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. Hmm. And here's the holy one. I'm going to end here. 
Acts 3, 14. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, which he is the just one as well, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. Oh, you know, and you know this interesting about in uh, the book of Acts is that when they start getting called out on stuff, that's why they didn't like Stephen. That's why they didn't like, you know, uh, Peter and Paul and Silas. They didn't like them because they were calling out what they had done. And see, here's the thing about this. When you call out what somebody done, they can't go back and change it. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. Y'all chose, they chose Barabbas rather than the Holy One, a known murderer, a habitual criminal. That's what you want? Over the Holy One, one that was sinless. But that's what you chose. <laughs> but he, it didn't change the fact, though, that he is, that he was, is, and will always be the Holy One. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to stop right there because that'll be a good a good place for me to stop tonight. Amen. <laughs> That's all I am. Amen. He is that. He is the I am. Amen. Amen. And I thank God for that. Certainly that. I want to complete this uh, list. I'll be able to complete it next week. And then I'm going to look at some of the names of God overall. And so how we look at some of those things. And I appreciate you all allowing me to walk back through. Like I said, I did a Bible study similar to this probably about three years ago before we were recording. So I at least wanted to try to do a, some form of this uh, again, just for the sake of recording for um, the ability to be able to go back and, and review it a little bit as well. All right. So again, just quickly before I close out in prayer, in-person services, Sunday, 10 o'clock, Double Tree Hotel. I hope if you're in the local area, we'll see you there. Bible study will continue on next week. And again, like I said, the beauty of this with the names is that if you walk with him at any time, he's been many of those to you. He may not have been all, but if you keep on living, amen, that list going to get bigger and bigger as to what he is to you. All right. And then men's ministry or men's Bible study. I encourage all the men, please tune in uh, on Zoom. The link is on the events page in Spirit, uh, Spirit of God as well. Um, and you'll be able to just, you know, get right in with no problem at all. 10 o'clock this Saturday morning. I know our brother Antonio is going to bless us with an anointed lesson that's going uh, we're excited about that. So, man, if you're able to make it, certainly please, please, please uh, tune in for that as well. All right. With that being said, we'll go ahead and close out in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We bless and praise your holy name. We thank you for who Jesus was, is, and will always be. That he is the eternal, holy one. That he is truly the I am, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. We thank you that we can see him not only throughout the biblical text, but we can also see him throughout our lives. Even when we didn't know him in the power of his resurrection, he was still one that would cover. He was still one that would protect. He was still one that would bring us peace. But we thank you that because he is the great high priest, we now have salvation that has been made accessible, available, and attainable through him and through his precious sacrifice. We thank you that he has been many of those names and titles and functions and purposes to us. And that, God, we know that as we continue to keep living and walking prayerfully in righteousness, that he will become more and more. And we'll see him as you desire that we see him. But we want tonight to say thank you for him. Now, Father, we pray. That your, that your blessing, your hand of protection, provision, covering be upon those who were impacted by Hurricane Helene and Hurricane Milton. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, restore power. Father, dry out the land. God, put materials in place to restore things that were damaged. But more importantly, Lord, help us to walk righteously and to put and keep our faith in you even in the midst of storms. Father, we thank you for covering and protecting those who are tied to and connected to this church during that storm. For Father, we saw you on yesterday, just as you took heat out the fire for the three Hebrew boys. We saw you, God, reduce the winds of Milton before it hit shore. Because God, we believe that you heard our prayer and we say thank you. So now, Father, we pray 
your blessing upon those impacted, as big and as much as you desire, that they may see your goodness in the land of the living. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen.